when the Buddha set out the basic requirements that he was looking for in a student, he didn't say that you had to have a PhD in Buddhist studies, or a bachelor's, or even a fourth grade education. He looked for two qualities, one that you be observant, and two that you be honest and no deceiver. That's because the course of study he's going to give you is one in which you have to learn from your mistakes. And those are the two qualities you're going to need. You have to be observant to watch your actions, look at the results. And you have to be honest when the results don't come out well. These are the qualities he trained his son in. You know the story. The Buddha came to see Rahula when he was seven years old, newly ordained as a novice. Rahula sees him coming, sets out some water for the Buddha to wash his feet. The Buddha takes a dipper, uses the water, and then leaves a little bit of water in the dipper. He asks Rahula, do you see how little water there is in this dipper? Yes. That's how little goodness there is in someone who tells a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. Then he throws the water away. See, that's what happens to the goodness of someone who tells a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. It gets thrown away like that. Then he shows him how empty the dipper is. That's how empty of goodness you are if you tell a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. So he's stressing the principle of honesty and truthfulness. <coughs> then the rest of the instruction is how to be observant. You look at your intentions first before you act. What kind of results do you expect out of the action? And if you expect harm or oppression? Or affliction, you don't do it. If you don't foresee any harm, you go ahead and do it, but then you watch the results as you're acting, and if any affliction is coming up, either for yourself or for others, you stop. You don't see any affliction, you keep on going. When the action is done, you look at the long-term results. Here again, that principle of honesty has to come in. What were the results? And if they did cause affliction, you go and talk it over with someone else who's more advanced on the path. So you can get some ideas of how not to repeat the mistake. And then you make up your mind, you're not going to repeat it again. There are the places where the Buddha says you realize you've done something wrong. You make up your mind not to repeat the mistake, and then you spread goodwill. Goodwill to yourself, so that you don't beat yourself up too much. Goodwill for the person you harmed and goodwill for everybody else. So it's take, make sure your motivation stays strong for the next time you have to really think about an action, what you're going to do. If you look back on your action and you saw there was no harm, you take joy in that fact and keep on training. This is one of the places where we look for joy in our practices, realizing that okay, we are able to train our actions so they're less and less harmful. And that too gives us sustenance for the next time we have to make a decision on how to act. So when you're pondering your actions, this is what you ponder. Actions right here, right now. There is that passage where the Buddha says that the results of karma are inconceivable. But what he's talking about is long-term results on into future lives, and also the question when, say, somebody dies in this lifetime of a strange accident, or why did that person die? Well, you don't know exactly know. You know the basic principle, but you can't trace out the details. If you try to tra trace out the details, you go crazy. It's because karma is so complex. 
And it's working out because just think of how many times you have to make a decision in the course of the day. You make lots of decisions. Some are skillful, some are not. Some are like seeds that give their results in a day or two. Others are seeds that give the results over long periods of time. So it's futile to try to trace down the causes for why a particular incident happens. But you take as your working hypothesis that you do have choices, and the quality of the action is going to depend on the intention. as informed by actions you've done in the past. And underlying all this is the quality of goodwill for yourself and for others, a sense of heedfulness that comes from that goodwill, that you don't want to harm yourself, you don't want to harm others. There's going to be bad consequences if you do. Lots of good qualities are brought together this way. And it's in this way that you learn how to protect yourself from bad karma, both from doing bad karma now and on into the future, and also from the results of the karma in the past. Because as you get more skillful in the present, develop that quality of goodwill more and more. You find that that's one of the qualities that Buddha recommends that you make unlimited. And as he says, when your mind is unlimited, and the results of past actions, which were bad, will be much more limited in comparison, so they won't have as big an impact. It's like a fine for stealing a goat. If you're wealthy, the fine hardly matters to you at all. If you're poor, you find you can't pay it, they throw you into prison. So we're amassing our wealth here. But amassing the wealth is not enough. In that practice of the Buddha taught to Rahula, the principle of looking at your actions, learning from your mistakes, applies to the meditation as well. And it's through the meditation that you develop the other skills that are going to protect you from the results of your past karma. There's another passage where the Buddha is teaching Rahula how to meditate. He starts off by saying, make your mind like earth. In the same way that the earth doesn't react when foul things are thrown on it. You don't want to react when unpleasant things happen. What this means is you, you want to have the mind in a position where it is fair in looking at the results of its actions. So if you see that you've made a mistake, you don't run away from it. And if you've done something well, you don't get too carried away. You want to take a very matter-of-fact attitude toward the principle of action so you can learn from it. But you don't just stay there with like a cloud of dirt. The Buddha does recommend that from that point, then you start working with breath meditation. And it's all very proactive, breathing in and out, aware of the whole body, breathing in and out, calming the effect of the breath on the body, breathing in and out in a way that gives rise to rapture, gives rise to pleasure. There's a lot of proactive decision-making and choices and learning from what you're doing. Now, how do you breathe in a way that gives rise to ease and rapture? How do you breathe in a way that calms the effect of the breath on your body? How do you breathe in a way that gladdens the mind? These are things you're going to have to learn for yourself. You can get pointers from other people, but your mind is your mind. Your breath is your breath. You have to learn how to put them together, and you have to observe. So when the pleasure comes up, you know how to handle it. As the Buddha said, you let it spread throughout the body. And once it's spread throughout the body, you try to develop an awareness that fills the body that's not affected by the 
a sense of pleasure. It knows it's there, but it doesn't go wallowing in it. This is one of the other prerequisites for not being overcome by past bad karmas. You're not letting the mind be overcome by pleasure. And this is how you learn. You give it a skillful pleasure like this, and then you learn how to have the right attitude toward it. When pleasure comes, usually we try to gobble it down. And that's that. But if you realize, okay, the pleasure can be there, and it, in fact, if you don't try to gobble it down, it'll stay there with the body and do its work. Have some trust in the pleasure. Have some trust in the principle of cause and effect. And you learn how not to be overcome by pleasure. At the same time, you learn some discernment, which is another one of the qualities that you're going to need. That's for not being overcome by pain, which is another one of the qualities you're going to need. You're going to run into pains as you meditate. You have to learn not to be scared off by them. And working with the breath is one of the ways that you give yourself a range of tools to use with the pain so that you're not cowed by it. You're not afraid of it. You know, there are ways of breathing through the pain, breathing around the pain. You can focus your attention on another part of the body. Say if there's a pain in your knee, you can focus on your other knee. Or if both knees are in pain, you can focus on your chest, around the heart. Try to find some part of the body that's not in pain. As John Lee once said, if everything in the body were in pain, you'd die. There's got to be some part that's not. Find that. Take up residence there. And learn how to not get worked up about the pain. Once you've got a sense of pleasure, then you can use that. And John Lee compares it to having lots of good friends who can drive all the gangsters out of your body. In other words, the more the pleasure develops, the more it can envelop the pain and dissolve it away. Or at the very least, put the mind in a position where it feels that it's comfortable where it is, it's fine where it is. If the pain is going to be there, it can be there. But you don't have to feel threatened by it because you're not trying to gobble it down. The mind can be at its ease, settled in. And that's another one of the skills you're going to need to protect yourself from past bad karma, which is concentration. So you've got the virtue of truthfulness, the concentration, the discernment, the ability not to be overcome by pleasure, not to be overcome by pain, and that unlimited attitude of goodwill for everybody. These are the qualities that are going to protect you from doing unskillful things in the future and protect you from a large part of the results of past bad actions so the mind doesn't have to suffer from them, even if the body gets afflicted in one way or another, the mind doesn't have to suffer. And these are the skills you learn from learning from your mistakes. After all, this is how the Buddha learned. He didn't have a teacher. He had a couple of teachers, but they only taught him part of the path. There's a lot he had to learn on his own. And this is how he did it. He did things, and then he looked at the results. If he didn't like the results, he changed what he was doing. And it came down to his being observant and honest. He realized that those were the qualities that had seen him through. So those are the qualities he would look for in a student. Those are the qualities we can develop. So you do your best to be honest and observant as you go through the day and as you meditate. And as you're going to ponder karma, this is what you ponder. What you're doing right now, the results of what you're doing right now, and the skills you're going to develop in order to do this well. will send their results back to protect you from the past and to protect you in the future. So 
so these are skills that will protect you all around.